Why are pickup trucks now are so expensive? Why? Now, we've asked this question before in many different ways. As a matter of fact, over the past year and change, we probably asked it on our podcast three or four times. But we've also answered it. We have. But there's more to this yes. uh, particular podcast because we actually have a couple explanations as to why. Yes. And part of this podcast um, has to do why mm -hmm. trucks are so expensive. And this is thanks to our supporter on Patreon.com, Ken Lewis. So thank you, Ken. Yeah. But also a big chunk of this show is actually we have a special guest. Ah, Yes, it's Dave Harrington, CEO of American Expedition Vehicles. I recently spoke with him in Montana mm -hmm. uh, at the GMC event, and we didn't talk about price of trucks, but we did talk about behind the scenes of what it takes to create a truck. And the components that go on to a truck. Exactly, right. because Dave and his company, AEV, works hand-in-hand -in -hand with General Motors mm -hmm. at their factory. So they're working together, which is kind of a rare thing. It is, and we're going to get into the weeds on that because, once again, we have that interview, so you're going to see a huge chunk of that. But leading up to that, we wanted to discuss these components and items that are leading to these expensive trucks because we've noticed that some people, I think, may have a misconception of why trucks are more expensive now than they ever have been. So we're going to cover that, but yeah. before we do, Andre, I wanted to bring up something. What? Um, it's not a rant per se, it's just a perspective. And I'm curious if listeners and viewers out there uh, feel the same way. This morning, and I had a rough Monday morning, you know, we, oh, we all- one of those? Yeah, it was, it's been a really rough couple of weeks, but today was just, just terrible. Anyway, so I'm, I'm in the car, I'm cruising along, everything's fine, I guess. I'm listening to music, trying to lighten the mood. Mm -hmm. And out of the corner of my eye, I see this yellow, very rusted truck. And I glance at it, and then I slow down. Because... Was this me in my Colorado? No. It was, okay. it was more rusted than your Colorado. Okay. Okay. Uh, no. It was what I'm guessing about a 1980 Datsun 720 pickup the, Ooh, with, with the king cab. No way. Right? With square headlights, king cab, four-wheel drive. And the thing is just beat to hell. It's smoking, it's pouring out an awful lot of which is probably burning oil. And, but it, it's just cruising down the highway on, on 36 heading towards Boulder. Probably some student who thought, hey, it looks cool, it makes me look like I'm hip. Um, and it just, it sounds terrible. It sounds like it's about to throw something. Like it's losing a cylinder or yeah. lost a cylinder Pretty along much. the way? Yeah, it's got the, you know, yeah. I can hear it from the highway. Yeah. <laughs> now, well, my, my question to everybody out there, including you, my friend is when you see trucks like this, and I'm being specific about trucks, do you ever just in the back of your mind think, I want to pull that guy over, offer him 500 bucks, take it off his hands and to actually take care of it? Like, do you ever feel sorry for a hunk of metal? I think it solicits an emotional response, right? I think that when we uh, see something that we like, and I really do like these old 80s, you know, and even early 90s trucks, I just love them. There's something about them that makes me want to go, you know, I want to care about you. I like you. You have personality, and I want to make you the best you can be. And I looked at that truck, and that was the first thing I thought of my, you know, it came out of my mind. It's like, I'm going to pull this guy over. I'm going to offer him. Then the second thing that came out of my mind was divorce. <laughs> I promised my wife. I'm sorry. No, no, no. It's all right. I promised her no new projects uh, this year. At well, least this year. Right, right, right. It, things can change next year, and then she'll be okay with it. But this year, no more. Okay. Yeah. So anyway, um, I want to know if you guys and if you have ever like been tempted to do something like that. And I bet you some of you guys have. My answer is yes. Mm -hmm. So I had a similar experience. I, I'm trying to rack my brain. I can't remember the exact model of, the, of this pickup I saw. Mm -hmm. But I saw something, a similar sight. A very worn out old pickup, small pickup rolling down the highway and i think one of its wheels was actually wobbling <laughs> yeah, right. it was quite dangerous in fact it looked dangerous yeah but still something i think it has to do with our profession really i, I wanted to it, it's unique it's rare yeah right that's the issue with pickup trucks because when people originally bought desirable pickups, they used them as pickups. They beat the crap out of yes. them. And he just used them up until they pretty much fell apart, threw them to a wrecking yard, and let them get crushed. Yes. But some of us appreciate that old metal now. Mm -hmm. So it's really hard to find a pristine example. And like you're describing, not a pristine example of whatsoever. But, but don't, don't, yeah. didn't you want to like think to yourself, 
I, even if it's going to cost three times of what the value of the vehicle's worth, I want to buy it and fix it up and make it good. Yes. Haven't you ever yeah, felt that it, way? It, yes, it has. Okay. Yes. I'm, and once again, I'm curious if you guys have felt that way. I want to hear your stories, too, about that. because. Well, actually, this is a great transition. Yeah. Because uh, our, our question from Ken Lewis actually has a lot to do with this. Well, why don't we go right into it? You've yeah. already heard my question out to you guys. Okay. I'm curious. So please respond to us either in the comments here down below. Or... Uh, or uh, ask a TFL truck, or you can go to oldtfl.com. Or they can or, become a Patreon. Or you can become a Patreon and speak to us almost directly. I mean, not live, but directly mm -hmm. uh, at patreon.com slash TFL car. And we will read your question, of course, if you want it out right here in front of everybody else. You go to the front of the line. And thank yep. you to our supporters. Yep. So Ken Lewis uh, here at Patreon, uh, I have an app open on my phone. Mm -hmm. um, he says the following. Uh, guys, Andre, Nathan, Roman, and Tommy, he just named the four of us. Yeah. He knows there's more people, but he named the four. Um, I got a question for you that I think you will rant about. I think he's right. <laughs> um, as been discussed on multiple times on podcasts, hey, Ken follows us pretty closely. Mm -hmm. uh, trucks are very expensive. Am I right or wrong? Yes, of course he's right. Second, is the inclusion of the new technology due to government mandates or a choice by the automaker? Mm -hmm. An example would be an adaptive cruise control system or a collision avoidance system for braking. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's stop right there. I think we, that's a good part of it that we could discuss. Right. I think that everything he mentioned is not required by the government yet. So, but certain things are. Yes. You know, it started decades ago, you know, with seat belts, then airbags, mm -hmm. then the reverse. Crumple zones too, by the way. Crumple zones, yeah. reverse camera. Lend These the ABS are, eventually. Uh, you know what? Hmm. And I didn't live exactly through this period, but you know the Nader? Uh, Ralph Nader? I know Ralph Nader. I've even met Ralph Nader. Is he your buddy? He is. No. A, he's, he's not. <laughs> he said we could not drive faster than 55. He was also the one who was behind killing vehicles like the Corvair, which he said were unsafe at any speed. But that's a whole so, different topic. By the way, this is not a, a political podcast. Nope. Uh, we, we don't discuss politics. We talk about vehicles. I hate all politicians we, we, anyway. Which, which is why, which is why you know, it's an escape. Yeah. You know, is. we can talk about pickups and cars and trucks. And Without having to go into, or at least trying to avoid as many political things as we can. Yeah. Unfortunately, the reality is, is that a lot of things like government mandates do tie into politics. But we're going to try to scrub away some of that and just go right to the bare ta brass tacks. Yeah. And, and then, so, uh, so... Ken's question, is it government or automotive companies, right? But I think there's actually a third player, mm -hmm. a huge player called the insurance In company. Insurance, because yes. liability, my friend. Yes. So there's a third big player, mm -hmm. which is also kind of a privately held uh, corporate player in this world. Um, and I'm directly looking at IHS, mm -hmm. right? Over the last several years, and I, we've seen this firsthand. Certainly have. They have ratcheted up the their stringent testing from where it was 10 years ago now they're requiring i mean they're testing for re rear passenger safety passenger side headlights headlight safety yeah. uh automatic braking system safety mm -hmm. so so let's just imagine you're an automaker and i'm an automaker okay right and let's say i decide to comply with the latest ihs standards because you know in ihs view you know more safety is better uh, because, you know, the, the insurance, um, you know, premiums could be adjusted for that, right? Right. And people really like safety. People want to be feel it safe. It is a selling point of many vehicles, which is why. If I decided to comply with all those tests, and what are you to do? Then if I don't, or if I do as, like the minimal and I get the worst scores, then when you guys are looking online, on TV, at billboards, one sign for Andre Automaker is going to be five-star rated and uh, top pick and da-da-da-da-da because he's got all of the components necessary. More importantly, he passed all the tests with flying colors. Then my billboards are going to say <laughs> fastest or loudest. least expensive, loudest uh, loudest or something, My, uh, I won't be able to use any of that data for uh, the opportunity to advertise with it. And as such, 
many, many people, I mean, you, you can look at the consumer reports all the way down to the actual automaker. They all seem to agree that having a positive safety score helps your sales. Look at Subaru, look at Volvo, just as examples. It's out there, it's all over the place, you can blatantly see it. As such, most automakers really want to comply with the IIHS and really make a vehicle that is super, super safe and gets that high score. Yes. There's also, of course, the government in this. Yes. There's NHTSA.gov, which we actually, I think, talked about last time on last episode. With, for recalls. For recalls. Yeah. But they also do safety testing, and they can also enforce many, many different items. Mm -hmm. um, so, yes. So government is also involved in this. Government area. is involved, but there is that other entity that we wanted to bring up. Yeah. So which one is um, at fault or not at fault? I mean... It's, it's also, by the way, there's a fourth party. It's the consumer. Mm -hmm. I'm pointing at myself. Yes, you are. Um, because you said something interesting on your billboard example. You said the least expensive, yes. the cheapest. I could be voting with my checkbook, and I could still buy your car mm -hmm. because, you know, I've been driving for several decades. You know, I feel like I'm an experienced driver. Right. I can avoid a lot of different aggressive drivers on the highway. I may not want a lot of your safety equipment. Mm -hmm. And so I would buy Nathan's car. Right, right. To save a few bucks. Yeah, I'll save maybe more than a few bucks. Well, that and that is part of this unusual rub right now because... Some of you miss the days, and I'm included, where you could get a basic pickup truck that maybe had an airbag or two and maybe had ABS or something like that, but really was a very simple vehicle. And you can get one for usually less than what you would buy the equivalent car. That was the old days. And they are far, far gone. So why are these trucks just base prices so much more expensive than let's say an equivalent car when i mean equivalent i mean something that could hold four passengers something that may have a v6 you know what i mean it, that type sure. of thing there's there's such a difference between building a truck and building a car and i think first of all it goes from the ground up and that is your suspension your frame your axles your tires and your wheels all of those things right off the bat based on a very simple car or a very simple pickup, more money is being invested into the pickup right off the start. It is, and a lot of it has to do with weight carrying capacities mm -hmm. as well. Yes. Like both will carry five people, mm -hmm. right? But, you know, and we're looking at a GMC Sierra heavy duty truck here in our studio. <laughs> Wait till you hear the price. Well, because it's an AV truck also. Yes, which we're gonna get to in just a sec. Yeah, and we'll talk about pricing as mm -hmm. well. Uh, but this truck, the, we're particularly looking at this heavy duty AV edition of the Sierra Heavy Duty 2500. It has a payload of about 2,700 pounds, mm -hmm. and it can tow up to 18,500 pounds, which means it has to have heavier springs. Heavier means more costly, right? Right. Larger springs. has to have larger tires. Uh, not because it's an off-road truck, but because those tires have to handle the weight. Exactly. Yes. Brakes. Bigger the brakes. axles, you know, everything that you're talking yeah. about has suddenly been beefed up and gone up a stage. Now, bear in mind that we're talking about an extreme version. This is an uh, off-road <laughs> badass that can tow and haul. This yeah. thing is really the whole package, <laughs> and the price reflects that. But going back to other things, and this leads into also the uh, video that we're about to connect, there's also specialty parts that a lot of you guys are ordering. Think about it. Many of you are ordering off-road versions of these trucks, 4x4 versions, Pro 4Xs, you name it. All of these suddenly bounce that price up a bit. Then you go to the next level, which is, of course, specialty parts that come yeah. from the automobile. Or even accessories, aftermarket. Exactly. Well, yeah. let's not even count the aftermarket. Okay. Let's just talk about what is offered when you go online and you order your truck. And in this case, there's one more expensive component, which is extremely cool, but it's pricey. And that is something that we're about to talk about here. Yes, uh, off-road gear. I think that's where you're going. Yep. But the reason why I brought in aftermarket components is because over time, manufacturers see what's really, really popular True, in the yeah. aftermarket. And they try to kind of integrate it into their own ecosystem. Well, look right? at Mopar. Look at Ford. Yeah. Yeah. Jeep performance parts. It's incredible, yeah. Mopar parts. Now AEV parts that are actually built at the factory with General Motors. This is crazy stuff. So AEV, American Expedition Vehicles... Uh, we, we've covered them before. They are not paying us for our testimony or anything else. However, we acknowledge that in the industry, they are 
well thought of. They build parts that usually are aesthetically pleasing and are extremely functional and come from good materials. Okay, so there's that. Yes. Then in addition, they're not cheap because all of these components are fairly expensive to build and sell. Then you have to think about all the components and how they actually fit to a production vehicle, right? Exactly. Exactly. Um, before we move on to AEV and a couple of other points, I want to read another point from Ken. Okay. Okay. So Ken says, thirdly, if the inclusion of the technology is a voluntary decision of the automaker and not due to government mandate, do consumers, especially truck buyers, want this technology? So we've been kind of almost already talking about this. Yeah, point, we, we've right? kind of covered we, it. We but... covered it. And then he continues a little bit more because Ken used to drive a very, very simple... <laughs> Straight six Ford engine, you know, no, no frills. Is it the three hundred? Three hundred yeah, cubic inch. Those things are so. Mm. So the, the point that Ken is trying to make here is, if you take away a lot of the components, you know, the, you know, the cru adaptive cruise control system, the, he doesn't mention airbags. Mm. Hold on. So so here's the list of parts he wishes a modern truck would have. A very simple non-turbocharged engine. Mm. It doesn't have to be powerful, according to Ken. Okay. Uh, a six-speed manual transmission, <laughs> and anti-lock brakes. So Ken says, you know, there's, there's he sees value in that. Air conditioning, a brake controller, and cruise control. Okay. So the only vehicle that currently exists that is then that sort of kind of lineup would be the Jeep Gladiator six-speed V6 because it's naturally aspirated. And, and it will continue to be so over for the at next, least for uh, the next couple yeah, of years yeah. that we know of. The Toyota is going turbocharged. Is going turbocharged. Yeah. Although, yeah, even the base model is turbocharged, yeah, right? The base so model. So they're all turbo, so you're out of luck there. So, um, Ken, you really want the Gladiator? Is that, is that what yeah, all so you're saying? Yeah, we're done. <laughs> I'm just kidding, Ken. Um, okay, important point here is that uh, I, I totally get where you're going at. Like, strip it down, make it simple, keep it cheap. Roll down windows, manual roll down windows. I'm right. down with that, by yeah. the way. Yeah. yeah, that would be totally cool too. Just keep it simple and keep it cheap so people can actually afford these things. But you also have to remember that automakers, truck makers, make a lot more money on a really expensive truck than they do on a very cheap truck because they're all on the same production line. So if they have a seventy or $80,000 truck on the production line and then right behind it a thirty or $40,000 truck, they're standing to profit a lot more on that $70,000 truck. Hence, they want to steer you towards that $70,000 truck as much as humanly possible. And they are doing it. They are. Yeah. And that's the thing. Demand is out there. And as long as people are buying them, they're going to keep selling them. However, yes. and this is probably another topic for another time, some automakers are starting to see a bit of a slowdown in the electrical overpriced truck market. And that might actually grow and perhaps affect the current regular truck market, regular meaning, you know, gas mm -hmm. or diesel, and perhaps will bring down some prices. I'm hoping so, but we're going to have to wait until these strikes are over and everything else. Yeah, we're living in a very difficult time right we now. We really are. Yeah, we are. This sucks. And it's also kind of exciting time because, you know, things are changing. So people look at change as bad. But also change can be good. It can be good in the yeah. truck world. So, you know, your, your, your questions are definitely valid. But the other point is trucks have never been safer than they are now. Trucks have never been more efficient than they are right now. Trucks have never handled better than they do right now. And trucks have never been as comfortable as they are right now. So yeah. all of those things come at a price as well. Yeah. And um, so if I get into a new pickup truck, right, mm -hmm. like you're saying, it doesn't matter what brand. They're very competitive. All, all these trucks are Across very, the board, very competitive. Sure. And it really drives like a passenger vehicle from 10 years ago yep. or 15 years ago. I'm talking about suspension that, like you said, is comfortable. The cabin is quiet. Yeah. You know, you don't have to scream at the passenger next to you. Um, it's, just, it's just a refined experience, and that's not free, right? <laughs> we got there over time by making small improvements and adjustments and improvement, you know, enhancements, all those things. Even additional materials used for sound deadening, even mat additional materials used to quell engine noise and, you know, these types of components, they're all, they, they cost a little bit of money. Now, at the end of the day, the good news is all these electronics that you're concerned about are much, much cheaper the more they make. The volume of that component brings down the price once it expands. Simple. However, you know, I, I still back you up 100%. 
why can't they just make something super simple, put it, put it out there? I'm, I'd be willing, personally speaking, to put my butt on the line and get a vehicle that only gets three stars instead of five if it's just me driving. But, you know, unfortunately, that's well, not always you, the case. You'll keep it for 10 years and you'll sell it to another person and on and on and on. Exactly. I mean, at some level, some sort of regulation has to be in place because right. it's not, you know, just a free-for-all for, for all of us, it's unfortunately. Not. And also all parties, cons- you know, all the parties, the, the automaker, the government, the insurance company, and the consumer are also looking down the line to what is necessary to keep these vehicles safe in 10 years. So yeah. all of that means, yes, pricey so, vehicles. transitioning to our wonderful special guest. Yes. Uh, first of all, I want to say this. We already kind of touched on this. I've seen, I don't know how many truck, uh, heavy-duty GMs and Rams and Fords, all of them. I've seen brand-new truck with crazy lifts, sometimes tasteful lifts. I've seen them with larger tires. I'm talking about 37s, maybe bigger. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I've seen them stanced. I've seen them lowered or whatever. I've seen them lifted and lowered at the same time, which is just (laughs) insane. I've seen them with giant pipes sticking out from under them. Um, So manufacturers have been watching. They're not sitting there idly. Mm -hmm. And they're saying, okay, so a consumer goes out and they buy one of our pickup trucks. And then immediately, almost immediately, they take it to a different shop somewhere locally, and they make all these adjustments and modifications to it. Why don't we offer those adjustments, some of those ad- modifications from the factory? Right. You're dropping immediately 10, 20, 50K on adding new components and toys to your truck. The automaker tends to think, hey, what if we did it and we charged more? Bam. Or sometimes less. Maybe you'll be saving if money. if you wanted to piece together this AEV truck, let's say you went out and you bought a bumper, and that has to be compliant, oh, by yeah. the way. Compliant. So it's got parking sensors. Yes. And it was crash tested. Uh-huh. Um, and then you wanted skid plates. And then you wanted bigger tires, bigger, you know, nice, high-quality wheels. Right. What if you wanted special touches on the interior? Maybe stitching. Maybe a special, I don't know, seat material. To make it unique. Yes. I would bet you you'd spend a pretty penny. Right. So, Okay. So how about this? So Dave Harrington, he was very gracious with his time with yes, me. Yes, he was. Um, we were actually riding. He was riding shotgun with me. We were on an off-road trail. I was driving a GMC Canyon 84X AEV. It's a mouthful, but yes, quite a truck. And I, we had the conversation. Mm-hmm. And I had to pause the conversation for just a few seconds here and there because I was negotiating boulders <laughs> as Dave was sitting next to me. But I think he appreciated that. You are Mr. Multitasker. It was difficult. But here's a behind-the-scenes look from Dave. Over 27 years of his company, here's what it takes to create an AEV truck. Well, Dave, thanks for coming along with me <laughs> on this drive. Um, so I've had a chance to talk to you on camera twice. First, it was a ZR2 Bison, the f- original generation. Okay. Yep. And then I also saw it SEMA several years ago. But now, you introdu- I mean, GMC and you guys are introducing this new 2024 truck. And it, it, it's like next level. Yeah, it's everything we wanted on the first gen <laughs> and couldn't do for whatever number of reasons. And uh-huh. now, we've, this time we got everything that, you know, both the engineers at GM and AEV wanted into the one truck. Yeah, so you your title is the CEO, right? You, That's correct. You're the big cheese at AEV, American Expedition Vehicles. Yeah. And look at this boulder, dude. We're 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 coming over uh, quite a. So the, we're also in your backyard. Is this your backyard? Relatively speaking, <laughs> yeah. It's my we're, home state, anyway. We're, we're in Montana, kind of where you started, right? Yeah, Montana. There, the there's big a state. slider. Yeah. There's a slider right there. <laughs> it's okay, you're using it. It's what it's meant for. So tell me about the company briefly, you know, for those people who may not have seen us before. Sure. So AEV, uh, <clears throat> primarily known for high quality expedition components. And and so what that means is, um, you know, it, it, it's not gimmicky. You know, we're not out there for the gimmicks. And we've, we've kept a pretty low profile, I would say, for a number of years. Mm-hmm. Um, we don't really advertise a lot, but people who are in the industry know, and um, and, and people who are, you know, enthusiasts um, quickly know who we are. 
and uh, we just built a reputation for really high quality and functional products. So I was at recently during the Detroit <coughs> Auto Show 2023, I was at your Michigan facility. I mean, you have a really, really awesome place there. I mean, and that's where you do a lot of the upfits as well, right? Yeah, yeah. so Michigan, we actually have two facilities. Um, one is a warehouse for all of our parts distribution and the other is an upfit and engineering uh, and design facility. Yeah, that's the one I was at. Mm -hmm. So I, I saw some of the stuff you were doing uh, upfitting some of the Jeep and the Ram vehicles, right? But, ooh, I just touched the mirror. It's okay. Sorry, I was too busy talking. Um, but you started like really kind of with Jeep components and some Dodge Ram components, is that fair to say? Yeah, yeah. our, our original history was in the in Jeeps and Jeep Wrangler. Um, we then moved on to the Ram components uh, and then built enough of a reputation in the full-size market that when uh, Chevy came out with the ZR2, um, their engineers came to us and said, hey, you know, do you want to be involved with this? And, and at first we were kind of like, you know, at the time, if you go back a number of years, you know, Chevy was kind of the, they weren't really known for off-road. Yeah. You know, they kind of had small wheel wells and just in, intrinsically they weren't really well suited. And, and so when they came to us, it was a little bit of a head scratcher. But then when we saw what they were doing, we said, hey, wait a second, this is... This is a viable platform. And dual lockers and all dual that stuff that comes the, with it. The suspension um, and everything they had. And, and then just getting to know the engineers that, you know, like they're enthusiasts yeah. and they're passionate about this. And so, you know, if you go back to 2016, um, you, you know, it was something that, and it was American made, which is kind of a, a, a thing for us. Yeah. Um, everything we do, we manufacture almost everything we do we manufacture in the u.s mm -hmm. um, so it was a really viable platform and i thought hey this is exactly what you know let's say toyota customers have been asking for for 20 years um, so yeah the dual lockers the you know the big tires all the all the things bumpers skid plates you know the rest of it right well then, then they came to us and said what would you do if you were going to take this truck and go around the world and you know for me it was 100 percent protection and you know so it was bumpers and skids um, primarily um, winch, um, you know, the ability to mount some lighting. Um, because in, in all my travels, it turns out it's normally not the off-road. Um, we build it for the off-road, but it's normally not the off-road stuff that ruins a trip. <clears throat> it's, you know, being in Mexico City and getting hit by a car, uh, you know, getting in a fender bender. Yeah. You know, that's the kind of stuff that will ruin a trip. Um, and so we really design, you know, not just for the off-road but just in general use too um just the toughness into it just, right yeah just it's it's making sure that you're always going to get home um so a lot of a lot of front end protection you know radiator headlights um you know as well as the off-road capability quite frankly is kind of the, that's the easy part mm -hmm. you know we you know we can add lockers and good tires and good suspension and that's kind of the easy part but then being able to make it drive with really good road manners and then being able to just make it tough um, that's kind of the, the, the trickier part. So let's talk about this now. We're in 2024 GMC Canyon 84X AEV Edition. It's a long name. <laughs> it's a mouthful, yeah. <laughs> but it's the next level, right? Because the previous generation of these midsize trucks, like you said, did not have big tires, were not lifted as much. And now with this new gen, GMC and Chevrolet came up with this platform that allows for a higher ground clearance, right? And we're, another and we're almost on 35s, right? Yeah, these are 35s, yeah. yep. And uh, part of that was them, um, you know, GM really enabled the larger tire by moving the entire front suspension forward uh, three inches. And so that, you know, if you get into like trying to put 35s on a Toyota, you know, you're into cutting the body mount out and re, re you know, reworking the whole thing. It's a lot of work. Um, and these guys were able to just enable it from the beginning. Um, and so uh, a better approach angle. Everything about this car, you know, they enable from the beginning. So on the early one, <clears throat> we were kind of stuck with the platform. And we and it we wasn't early so on. Much. It was kind of in the middle of that platform, right? Yeah, right, yeah, yeah, that's true. It was almost in the, yeah, it was in the middle of the platform. It was a refresh. So we could, you know, they could only enable so many things. And so even though everybody wanted bigger tires, it was a big complaint with the original Bisons. Mm -hmm. You know, we want bigger tires. I think I was one of those people. Too. Probably. <laughs> and, and so, yeah. you know, it was just not, when you're doing it through the factory and when you're doing this as an OEM, 
there, there's a lot of things that you know the the consumer and the enthusiast might not understand all the details that go into the backside that you never see but with this new truck um, by moving that forward three inches and just enabling it from the start um, yeah we were able to get 35s on this truck so this is really you know in our opinion this is kind of the ultimate uh, mid-sized truck this is what you would do if you were going to drive around the world this is the truck yeah and people used to do it in their garages you know maybe by themselves <clears throat> some enthusiasts would get the chainsaw or i mean a sawzall yeah. <laughs> and start cutting and welding but this is a manufacturer vehicle that comes with a warranty you know you're working with gm right on it and together so talk a bit to me about some of the challenges because i know you know gm has a lot of requirements so talk to me a little bit about that yeah there's some obvious ones that you know everybody might uh, might assume um so i when i talk about like i, I look at gm as there might be uh, 50 internal customers to gm and so by internal customers within gm i mean like there's the crash guys and you can assume like okay you know yeah we have to go through frontal crash and rear crash and offset crash and you know all the crash testing but then there's the cooling you know the cooling team we have to satisfy all their needs um and so you think okay those are the obvious ones um, but then you get into doing it on the assembly line and so now we're talking ergonomics you know we have to install this bumper in 29 seconds um okay we have to worry about a 55 percentile female assembly line worker not being able to apply five pounds of force in a certain direction um, we have to worry about the sequencing robots and where the bumpers go on the line and how they get sequenced into the line. So now we're designing the bumpers, not only for off-road protection, right? Which you might, okay, you know, big tow hooks, winch, easy, lots of steel. But then when you try to implement that into an assembly line, um, like for instance, one of our other products, a front bumper might take four hours to install in the aftermarket. Mm -hmm. You know, here we've got 29 seconds. <laughs> That's insane. Right, and it has to be repeatable over and over. Yeah, yeah well, I, that's a great point because uh, when people think about the aftermarket, they think post-sale, right? You know, you get a truck or a SUV or whatever you may have, and you get it to a different location, and then you start working on it. Mm -hmm. But you're talking about, you're sending your bumpers and your skid plates to a GM facility. And now, now you'll, not only do you have a mid-size truck, you also have the half-ton and the heavy-duty. That's right. <laughs> Yeah. And all of them are same requirements, right? Yeah, and if you look at the half ton, you know, just just honestly, just the packaging to build the bumpers, package the bumpers and ship them to Mexico with no damage, ready to install, ready to go on these sequencing robots. Um, it's, it's an amazing amount of work. So today's office is really cool because you and I are in the truck and we are negotiating a boulder field yeah. in Montana <laughs> and Julio uh, from the GM team he is my spotter he's very precise what's the cowboy hat it's the cowboy hat uh, he got a new nickname his new nickname is a uh, cowboy Julio <laughs> putting me on the precise path but I I also have cameras everywhere I'm going into the bush Julio <laughs> there's a tree it's okay it'll buff out as long as everybody understands that um, I was worried about it and and I was told by Julio and team that I should go this way I just wanted to make that clear you okay it, you got it on camera <laughs> so there's proof yeah anyways so or yeah so I, I actually you're right I was not thinking about productionalizing making it simple to install and having it repeatable right because there's a lot of these vehicles now um, yeah and you know, and so we have to look at it from the customer standpoint, the, the end user customer, right? We know what they want. That's that's easy. Um, but then trying to make that into a, 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 put something that can go on the assembly line is is just a whole other world of headaches. And I joke around that I was, I was I, and I still should do it, but I was gonna make my team um, block heater shirts because it took us months to figure out how to do the block heater. 
anyway. can you tell me about this a little bit more? I mean, you think it's Are you like, talking about the diesel? Uh, <clears throat> the diesel it, it was gas or diesel. Okay. But, you know, you think about it and you think, oh, a block heater, how, how simple could that be? I mean, you know, not that hard. But literally, we spent months because if, if the truck gets a block heater or doesn't get a block heater, right? that's a basic question. And if it doesn't get a block heater, that's two permutations of a bumper that go into the plant. Okay. In order to do two permutations of the bumper, uh, I think at the time that required us to knock out a wall of the plant and put up another 20,000 square feet of space for the sequencing robots. Because that's how, because if these bumpers come in, they get put on a little robot okay. that shuttles around and they all get in order. So a red bumper, a blue bumper, an AEV bumper, they all get in line. So they just get put on the assembly line. And so, so okay, well that wasn't, you know, that was like $4 million to put up 20,000 square feet for the block heater. <laughs> So we can't do that. So then, you know, you go to the next step. Well, we'll install the block heater on the line. And that's where you get into like the ergonomics of a 55 percentile female worker couldn't apply five pounds of force to twist it to install it on the line. Okay, so now what's the choice, you know? Now, you know, we looked at like, okay, all trucks get them. I mean, I think we settled on all trucks get them. And because it was actually cheaper, you know, the block heater, I think it was like three bucks, four bucks. And so it was actually cheaper Instead of doing them, the whole other thing. Instead right? of trying to figure out how to have two permutations of a bumper. But, you know, I mean, it, it's funny because you think it's so easy, but it, it, it literally involved, you know, 50 people for a couple months trying to figure out how to do that. Because, you know, even three or four dollars does add up when you're talking, you know, this many vehicles. Mm -hmm. So Yeah, that's quite interesting. And then, um, obviously, so... So you have the front bumper and the rear bumper, then on the specifically on this mid-size platform, and then you have all your skid plates as well, yeah. right? Five of them still, right? Depends on the vehicle, okay. but yeah, for the most part, five. Yeah. I think the heavy heavy is four. Yeah, yeah. I was noticing that. I think the the fuel tank may not have on the heavy. Yeah. On the heavy duty, but we'll, heavy duty will will we'll be driving that later little, later, later yeah. in the afternoon. Um, so. Yeah. So your philosophy there was still the same, right? So making it as lightweight as possible and strong, right? The as strong as the possible. The skids were an interesting one because if you go back to the skid plates on the original Bison, you know, I think they had settled on, we had a meeting, they had said, okay, we want a front bumper and we want a rear bumper and we want skid plates. And by the way, at the end, you know, you have 72 pounds to play with. You can add 72 pounds to the vehicle. And mm -hmm. we said, well, at the time, like we're, you know, just a transmission skid is going to be 100 pounds. You know, it's gonna be quarter inch steel or three sixteenths inch steel and yeah. it's gonna be a hundred pounds so that didn't work and one of our guys knew about boron steel because that's like in all your a pillars your b pillars you know the safety cell of the car has really changed because that's that's what they use but at the time nobody had ever done exposed boron steel so we had to develop a whole coating process for it um, chemically it's so hard that it really wouldn't take the coating so we had mm. to develop that and we were really the first company to ever used that material and it turns out in hindsight it's really the best material we've ever found for skid um, because it, it gets hardened on the die so it's a hardened steel unlike a regular steel and so there's really um, it won't gouge and it's really slippery so as far as a skid plate goes not only is it lightweight and thin um, but it's really slippery so it works so like I was using it just a little bit ago it doesn't impede your process yeah, yeah. and so you can keep moving like yeah. aluminum's like the worst because it gouges really heavy um it's soft so if and you it have stops to weld progress it, right it stops so, progress yeah. and if you if you do have to weld it it's annealed um it's just it's it's like i i kind of consider it one step up from a wood skid plate uh it's really <laughs> really a poor material i mean aluminum is good in other places right <laughs> yeah oh yeah it has its has its place but yeah. for a skid plate it really wasn't very good and so for the ultimate um, the unfortunate part is the boron steel is really expensive. The tooling's really expensive. So even in a lot of our aftermarket components, we, we don't have a business case for it. But in, in this case, there's enough volume that we could make that material work. So the consumer ends up getting an amazing product that, you know, you literally can't buy in the aftermarket. And if you get into, you know, payload, um, you know, I kind of look at it like I know a lot of people were comparing Tacoma. But if you look at the payload of the Tacoma and this, and they say, well, this is less. When I say, well, if you're if you're buying the AEV edition, you're assuming that you want front bumpers and skid plates, and you have to take all that stuff and throw it in the back of the Tacoma and then weigh it, right? And, and so find out what it is. Yeah, after it, that. it's not light, right? You know, yeah. especially in the aftermarket, it's it's even heavier. Um, 
you know, we do everything as light as possible. We do all the uh, FEA, so on the bumpers, everything's as strong and as light and as optimized as possible. Yeah, that's very important because obviously payload is what the ultimate customer, the driver, that's what I care about because if I want to bring my family in a tent or whatever behind me, right, that's what I care about. Yeah. And when you're buying, you know, I mean, Tacoma is changing too, right? They have a new generation of Tacoma coming online pretty soon. Uh, but when you're buying this AV edition Canyon, bigger tires weigh more, right? <laughs> Everything adds up, Everything right? Everything adds up. That's so, right. so you're watching, like you said, every pound or every gram. You just I mean, have to compare apples to apples, and that's where a lot of people are getting confused with with the two. And so, yeah, um, I don't think in the aftermarket you could buy this level of protection. I know you can't buy this level of protection for that amount of weight, and really cost. Mm -hmm. I mean, the cost on this um, is really really comparable and if you really sit down and compare apples to apples this is a, actually a really good deal yeah um and you said i mean can a person take some of these components like bumpers and <clears throat> add them after the fact or some components can um like the the front end on the half ton truck is really difficult because there's a lot of uh different pieces and parts that need to be added I but like on a heavy duty on the um, Colorado yes you can add some of that after the fact and we do sell some of it after the fact but mm -hmm. you're still better off just buying the whole thing right right from GM as a product. And because it's built at the factory so like you said it's all serialized and it's all I mean that process is I don't think a lot of people understand how much goes in at the factory you know like every bolt like just a ratchet at the factory is like you know, somewhere between fifty and a hundred thousand dollars, depending on the ratchet, mm -hmm. because it records every single torque, and it goes into a database. And twenty years later, the factory can look at that bolt and be like, "No, no, that was torqued." If perfectly. somebody complains or something happens, right? Yeah, yes. yeah. And so, um, everything's recorded, and and everything is. It's not as simple as you think, and even like bringing a new bolt into the plant requires you know hundreds of people and and then you have to figure out how you're going to error proof that bolt like what if that bolt looks just like this bolt but it's two millimeters shorter and uh somebody grabs the wrong bin you know so everything has to be error proofed um, sometimes you'll see bolts with a weird paint mark on it or something and that's mm. what that's what's going on there okay yeah i i, I get it it's, it's way different from building it in your garage after the fact right <laughs> or even at our even at our facility Right. At our facility, we still don't build like like these are built. Because because you, you do some of the Jeep upfits, right, and Ram Ram trucks, right? Yep, we do, and we and we do. We're starting to do a lot of Chevy upfit as well, or GM, I should say, yeah. both both GM, uh, Chevy and GMC. Across the board, like midsize and full size trucks. So we'll be introducing some more programs here in the future. Uh, I can't talk about it quite yet. Okay. But yeah, we'll we'll have some more programs here qu quite quite uh, soon. Have you been on this trail before? I have not. Okay. Because you, you, I mean, you. <laughs> what? Why? Why did you start the AV? Or why? <laughs> well, I mean, you were just getting out and trying to travel, like in these mountains or something. Well, the original, uh, the backstory of AEV is I, I, um, my dad had a Wrangler. He was nice enough to let me take it to college, and I realized real quickly that it kind of rode rough, and that it. Uh, uh you know it was just tiny uh -huh. and so i i don't know why but i came home one day and i said i'll fix that and uh i'll, I'll <laughs> cut it in half and stretch it okay and so uh which sounds crazy and i i didn't really have much i didn't ever even change my own oil at the time um but i just went and bought a 40 dollars socket set and and proceeded to do it and about a year later it was all done and it looked great and it functioned great and um i learned a lot but i uh as a capstone class in college in business school you had to write a business plan and you had to come up with an idea and so I, I just randomly came up with the idea that I would stretch these jeeps and so that's how AEV, and do it for customers yeah, yeah. And, and then I won the business plan competition and then we went on to do other business plan competitions and did really well and then uh, after graduating I just I you know I figured well I didn't have anything to lose and so I take that down to the I took that business plan to the local bank and I got a loan for thirty-two thousand dollars, and that's how I started AEV. And that was like ninety-seven ish. That was ninety-seven. Yeah. Yep. And then what I realized is, um, at the time, I realized if you know there were a lot of components out there for 
Wranglers, but even if you wanted to spend more money to get a better quality component, mm -hmm. um, that there was no higher level. Um, there, you know, so and I, I, I just assume that hey, there's people out there who are willing to pay for high quality if somebody were to provide it. And at the yeah. time, everything was kind of press brake and weld and pretty rudimentary. I mean, yeah. it, it functional, but rudimentary. And so I always, um, I just kind of realized I think there's a demand for, you know, the next level of components. And I think it goes with almost anything, any accessory, like a piece of jacket or clothing, right? Or a boot, right? If you could buy a boot and it'll be worn out in six months. Or you can buy something higher quality, you know, and you can keep it for a long time. And, yeah, and you're willing and to pay it. for it. Right? Yeah, and you're willing to pay extra. In this case, there was there was no higher quality boots, <laughs> right? Even if you even if you had the money and you were willing to pay, it just didn't exist. And I kind of realized, I said, you know, I think with the Land Rover, that that stuff does exist, um, and and maybe even Toyota to a certain extent, um, but not for Wrangler. And so that's how I originally started the company, was just that you know through that mindset. But for GM, GM did, in this case, the suspension design, right? Yes. You weren't really involved no. from, from that standpoint. You were involved in the protection and that package yeah. standpoint. But also productionalizing was a huge deal, obviously. It's a huge uh, deal, and I don't think there's another company that I know of in the world that can do that. And, you know, you might see, like, uh, you know, you might you see some components from the aftermarket on OE vehicles, maybe Brembo brakes. Um, you know, Recaro seats, something yeah, to that yeah, extent, sure. but yeah. you really don't see stuff like this. And, and those products are normally a lot different than the OE or than their aftermarket products. Um, and so this is uh, this is kind of the first that I know of um, for this kind of thing. For this type of outfit, but also at an OEM level. Yeah. yeah. This is a cool trail. I'm I'm enjoying this. And thanks for your time, dude. Thanks for Absolutely. coming along and kind of talk about some of this. <clears throat> so did um, so we talked about the mid-size truck, the Canyon. Were the half ton and heavy duty? Do, did those pose different challenges or kind of similar challenges? Similar, as as similar challenges. Um, I would say the half ton was probably the most challenging. Okay. Um, only because you know to get a, a winch and the tow hooks and everything. Um, on a frame that wasn't initially designed for it, that was a challenge. And if you kind of think about, um, you know, this this version of the AT4X or the Bison, the Colorado Bison, you know, this is Gen 2. And so those were both the heavy duty and the the light duty or Gen 1. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we had similar issues, like we, we wanted a lot more, but you can only get so much. I got gotcha. you. Um, but I think at the end, we got more than the original Bison. Like I think that those two vehicles are, they're kind of somewhere in between. Um, and so we got a lot more than we did on the initial Bison. But it's, uh, I think both those vehicles are pretty phenomenal. And you know, I'm a I'm a heavy duty guy, right? I live in Montana. I use my truck. I'm always towing a skid steer or an excavator, uh -huh. um, and and I wheel those things. And and you know, for me personally, I like the heavy duty. It's just that's my thing. Um, but I can see like you know when you go to Michigan or you know California, someplace different. That's when you know the half ton. You know, just depending on the user. I mean, it's nice sure. to have like all those different capabilities because there are so many different truck users and buyers. Yeah. Um, I think a lot of people who are used to, you know, a, a mid-sized vehicle, they get in heavy and they think, oh, this is absolutely insane. It's, um, it's huge, yeah. Yeah, it feels big if, yeah. if you're not used to it. You know, I've driven a heavy for the last 20 years every day, so to me, they feel perfectly normal. Yeah. Um, but, you know, so from a journalist standpoint, I see the, I see the challenge. But when you're talking to different consumers, I mean, for a guy who's working in the woods, you know, with heavy equipment, whether, you know, logging or construction or whatever, I mean, that that heavy, what an amazing piece of machinery to get yeah. right from the factory. And also, you, I don't know, maybe you're helping somebody out. You need to recover something, right? Bring a big vehicle in. I don't know, maybe you're using the winch to pull somebody else out or something like this. Well, and we originally got in the heavies um, because people were asking us for more capability on the Wrangler and they oh. were saying hey you know we want because it doesn't tell very much right at can't, all can't carry very much yeah. right so but there's a lot of people want to go you know haul more tow more 
you know, whether it's a ski boat and a camper at the same time. Uh-huh. I mean, the, you know, surf boat, the, uh, you know, the heavies will do that. You know, you can put a, any of the sliding campers in it and tow a boat. Totally. Right? Or tow snowmobiles or, I mean, anything, any of that stuff's pretty minor, but then you can also work on, work with it during the week. Um, and, you know, a heavy would do this trail no problem. I mean, it's, it's they're pretty amazing. Yeah. And because, uh, and to GM's point and others, um, owners already were doing it to their trucks. You know, owners were lifting their trucks themselves or yeah, putting we, bigger tires on or doing what, you know, side uh, rock protection, mm -hmm. right? So the manufacturer actually saw that and said, you know, we need to do that too. A <laughs> lot know, of we, dealers we can do, do it. it, right? Yeah, a lot dealers, of the dealers do are doing yeah. it because they realize that, you know, that's how people are using it. And I mean, there's countless dealers here in Montana, Idaho, you know, the Western US that, you know, the first thing they'll do is pop the bed off, put a flatbed on, put a heavy duty bumper on and some different tires. Yeah. And, you know, that's how they're selling these trucks. And that's, you know, that's how a lot of people are using these trucks. Yeah, it makes sense. And uh, so the light duty 1500 Sierra came out initially with a V8, right? So it had the 6.2 and then I think, well, I was one of the people who said, where's the diesel? Where's the three liter? And now there is one. And not only is there, you know, is the one, but it's also standard. Yes, it's right? standard, yes. So yeah, now we, the three liter is now standard. And if you haven't driven it, it's amazing. I mean, it, it is a fantastic package with that transmission and engine. It's one of Did my you have favorite. to redo anything for your bumper or anything like that? We, we um, you know, so from the beginning, we knew that was coming. Okay, okay. We knew that was a desire from the GM team to get that diesel in that truck. And so we had initially designed for both. And, you okay. know, that's another challenge when you're talking about cooling and having the intercooler and all that stuff. Uh, and, and, you know, aftermarket bumpers, they're not going to, they're not going to know. Like, you know, the guys designing the aftermarket stuff just all know that, hey, you know, we need whatever number of square millimeters for cooling right in this area and we can run the simulations and we know that this is going to pass. Um, and what happens is that, you know, the trucks, especially diesels, will just start derating almost immediately. And you don't know that, you know, as a consumer, you uh -huh. might not know that it's derating, but that's what happens is they just start derating immediately because the temperatures are getting hotter and it's trying to protect itself well, right they don't have the intercooling Basically. ability right yeah. and so you know less dense air less fuel yeah uh pretty simple <laughs> equation yeah yeah yeah. but totally it, and you lose power in the end <clears throat> you from, lose from power that. in the end and you might not even know it um because it's not going to throw a warning or anything it's just that's what it's going to do um but our bumpers are designed fully um you know to to maximize all that stuff uh, and so it, 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 and even just doing the airflow analysis with the GM team was, um, I mean, it's amazing. I mean, it's amazing what they can simulate. Mm -hmm. um, and it's amazing what, you know, how many different renditions we have to go through and and, and how finite those details are um, when it gets to it. It's like, oh, okay, we need to change this radius ever so slightly, you know, to not trip the airflow so that we're getting the adequate cooling. Um, it's really almost mind boggling. And I don't think the average consumer they'll never know the full story and they'll never know how much detail goes into every little part of these components. Well, hopefully now they understand a little bit more about it because I'm still learning. Thank you for kind of talking with me about through this. And then the three liter <coughs> light duty Sierra, it's also winch capable, right? Absolutely. Yeah. The bumper is there and it's winch capable. The, the winch mounts there. Literally, you just have to add the winch. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's with all, all three trucks. Because that's important because you know, when you have that straight six, the straight six engine is a little bit longer, obviously by the nature of it, right? Yeah, I think it's the cooling package on the diesel that was actually kind of what drove, you know, and, and sometimes people will say, oh, your approach angle is not as good on the half ton. Uh, and technically that that is true if you go with the, uh, you know, because there's only so much room between the end of the frame rail. If you're gonna put a winch in there, you can't fit it between, mm -hmm. you have to put it in front. So there are some things that we had to give up ever so slightly i mean we're talking like something a customer might probably would never notice you know you're talking like points of degrees mm -hmm. um and especially with the bigger tires you know the like on this truck i think it's 0.1 degrees i mean it's yeah. it's almost immeasurable it's um, a little bit noticeable on a heavy duty truck because the front bumper on the heavy duty <coughs> truck pokes out just a little bit like i can see it you know poke out a little and it has to right yeah. if you're gonna fit a winch it has to so that's a trade-off yeah um but i'll say um, you know, if you were, if one were to put 37 inch tires on, which is pretty easy, okay. um, those numbers change rapidly. <laughs> 
Yeah, and because you do have that lift, right? Yeah. It's important, you know, to bigger tire so it doesn't rub, right? It needs that lift. Yeah, and, and even with the, the, just as they come from the factory with the 35s, um, you know, it's, it's not a, uh, it's not really a functional issue. Um, you know, you, everybody likes to compare numbers, um, but when it gets down to it, it's rarely is it actually gonna stop you from going somewhere. Mm -hmm. Plus you have an additional capability of the winch, right? Uh, to begin with. Exactly. So, you know, for recovery of other people, for helping yourself, for helping others. And you have all the added structure in that bumper. I mean, these are real bumpers. They're not, you know, there are some steel bumpers I've noticed like on maybe a Raptor or something. They're still really thin. They're not, they're just not like what these are. I mean, these are all the, these are stronger than most aftermarket bumpers. When you look at them, they're two and three layers of steel. Um, because they are accommodating for the winch and that's kind of an interesting point if you look at the rear bumper on this midsize um, There's a plastic cover and you're supposed to take that cover off and you go oh, on, the, on, the, on the bottom on the rear Yeah, yep, on all on both corners. Yes, yeah. the rear corners are kind of the most vulnerable spot on a pickup Yeah, so you pull those rear corners off the plastic corners are designed to come off quickly You can wheel it you can scratch those things up They'll take all the abuse and when you're back on the road you just put the plastic clips or covers back on and away you go, you don't even have to touch a paint. So it's like a kind of a cosmetic little plate. Yeah, yeah. I noticed it on the other truck as well. And I, I, it's on this truck as well, right? It is, so you yeah. just take them off, throw them in the glove box, go wheeling, don't worry about it, use it the way it's supposed to be used, and then put the covers back on. And, and like I said, you don't even have to touch a paint, um, the corners. And if you look at those corners on this truck, it's actually 10 millimeters, there's a 10 millimeter thick skid that's uh, you know almost three eighths of an inch. Then there, or it's over three eighths of an inch. Then there's two layers of three millimeter steel on top. So that's 16 millimeters, which in inches would be about five eighths of an inch thick steel in the uh -huh. corner. <laughs> I mean, it's absolutely uh, phenomenal for a pickup truck. Well, speaking of that corner, I think I might be using it right now, or will be in a few seconds. <laughs> Use it. That's what it's for. Yeah. So when we started this drive. Julia, who's one of the leading drivers of this convoy, said, you know what, we're taking a uh, moderate trail. Remember he said that? Yeah. <laughs> and as far as a journalist program is concerned, this is one of the gnarliest trails I've been on for a journalist program. <laughs> so that just tells you the level of difficulty that we're doing yeah and i think that's part of, you know it's part of the thing is this, this truck does make it easy very informative and surprising the amount of work it actually takes on the end of the automaker to make sure that these components not only fit but they can repeatedly fit the right way with the right tensions and everything else that the robots are doing and the people who are physically moving them are doing it's incredible yeah, so it's I, I thought I had a great enough insight before I spoke to Dave, but still I'm learning yes. every single day from people like Dave, insiders like this, industry experts. So it was really, you know, thank you, thank you for your time. And um, yeah, and he even said that. He even said some of the parts that we build at AEV, mm -hmm. if you bought them separately, it would have been way more than doing it this way because volume creates an opportunity to discount some of these parts. Exactly. So he said it himself. I did not say that. <laughs> so so yeah, no, it was it was quite special. Now to the price. All right, drum roll. So I was just building it online. Yes. Um, I went on GMC. We thought we, I, I picked GMC because it was the most recent truck we tested. Yes. Um, it's actually in our press fleet right now. Yeah, and it, it, it looks amazing. It's just... A, yeah, we just looked at it. What a, what um, a just, it, The thing has curb appeal. Yeah, and <laughs> it's got presence. When you see it, no matter which street or highway it's on, it's got presence. It's like it wants to club you in the head with a baby seal. Um, no, thanks. Um, so uh, crew cap standard bed GMC, just basic work vehicle. Starts at $51,095. Okay. Then you have to pick a trim, right? And they have many trims, including mm -hmm. Pro, which is the work truck, SLE, SLT, AT4, Denali. Denali Ultimate is also there, and also mm -hmm. AT4X. AT4X gas engine um, starts at 84795 So now that includes the DSSV Multimatic shocks. Right. 
and bigger tires, these are 35s, and everything else that's um, included in a Sierra luxury truck, including special headliner. You know, that's one thing I could go without. A headliner? Why we, yeah, why do we need a special, uh, you know, Alcantara or something on our headliner? In case somebody looks up? I, I honestly don't know. <laughs> I Honestly speaking, I, I, I still have a hard enough time just looking at stuff and going, why do I need all these gizmos? But okay. yes, there's that. Um, but um, The diesel... My friend. That's what I was about to ask. So moving to diesel, how much? It starts at 94285 because the diesel is $9,500. That is a very pricey diesel. And we've talked about diesel pricing before. Yes, you know, we have. Uh, so there are other the videos, exactly, in the past. So then we're not done yet, right? Because... because <laughs> the pain we, continues, my friends. Well, the, the pain or the paint? Well, the paint... <laughs> The paint it also can cost some money. Well, up to six hundred and forty-five dollars. Yeah, volcanic red is six forty-five additional, but you know what? It, it's worth it. Well, you're, I you mean, you love red, and the way this truck looks in person is amazing. Yeah, and then there's more. If you choose AEV package, we haven't chosen AEV yet. Here we go. AEV package is ninety-four hundred dollars for a grand total of a hundred and four thousand three twenty-five. So let's just say, let, let's just call it $105,000 yes. for a heavy duty pickup truck that is extremely capable off road and is unique based on not only its powertrain, off road capability, DSSV, which we, by the way, agree is one of the best suspension systems out there. Um, but also, then you have the armor essentially that comes in from AEV. What would be the equivalent of that? Would it be a Ram Rebel? Um, so heavy duty rebel is now exists. Too. Yeah, and actually I did a little video, not little. It's like twenty something minutes long. Um, I did an off road heavy duty comparison yeah. video recently where I compared heavy duty rebel, uh, Chevy Silverado ZR2 heavy duty, the cousin to this truck. It is a cousin to this, um, and also the super duty tremor uh-huh. edition, all in one video. I compared them, and <laughs> the. There's a King Ranch version of the Ford. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's also Platinum version of the Ford that you can add the Tremor off-road packages to. Sure. And you know how luxurious those interiors are. Yeah. And those are also six-figure trucks. Those are 102,000. So that would compete directly with this. Exactly. So respect. if you're not picking the base Tremor, but if you're picking like a King Ranch or a Platinum Super Duty Tremor, diesel Mm -hmm. you're looking at the same price and i think that price was on purpose because they do compete directly uh, directly and that's why they're competing (laughs) so gm is not alone here um and then heavy duty rebel uh, i priced one out it's only ninety six thousand. Oh, well that's a bargain (laughs) yeah (laughs) okay so but i think we can all agree that i mean they're extraordinarily expensive however we are talking about very powerful, capable trucks that can tow quite a lot, and in this guise, can do some real off-roading. Of course, I'm not a big fan of super heavy trucks off-roading. There are certain issues, but at the same time, that does have all the tools to really get you out of an awful lot of trouble. And the cool part is, is that a lot of you guys who would use this as a tow vehicle, it can come get you after you wiped out. Yeah. So that's a good, that's yeah, when, a positive. Yeah, when you flip your side-by-side, this will arrive <laughs> right. you know, and pick you and, up. And save you. And then you ride back in luxury to your five-star hotel while other people who are overlanding are actually in a tent somewhere. So that's a whole different discussion. Yeah, exactly. And um, so, yeah, I mean, these trucks, like we mentioned, uh, so w- I want to tow with one of these. Mm-hmm. So oh, we yeah. need to load it up heavy. Um, and uh, I want to close on this thought. This truck is not for everybody. No. Right? Um, a mid-sized truck may be more suitable for what you're doing. Uh, if you're not towing much, or maybe you live in a big city, you cannot even physically park this anywhere. Or if you want more maneuverability and yeah. more off-road capability, yeah. frankly, a mid-sized or truck is Or maybe an electric vehicle is best for you. Perhaps Who it knows? is. Yeah. But, but the beauty is we have choice, right? So that's the final beauty. Because so, I want to end on a... Po- slightly positive note. And there still are a somewhat affordable trucks out there. You really have to look for them. And maybe you have to deal, you know, deal with some things that you didn't want to. Perhaps you have to buy, oh, I don't know, a front-wheel drive hybrid if you can't even find one. Or maybe you'll have to You're buy... about Maverick? Yeah. Yeah. Or maybe if you need more towing capability, maybe you have to get a V6 that you really didn't like very much. But that's what it comes with, and that's the cheap one. Yeah. They are out there, especially used ones right now, obviously, because, you know... 
Uh, but that the, you know, the bottom line is yes, they're very, very expensive out there. His question is very valid. We've given you a couple reasons why, and hopefully in the comments below, you guys can add to that. Right? Yeah, and then you heard from an industry expert like Dave. So, yeah. uh, and he talked about what it takes to upfit a factory. You know, that's not free. No. You know, to add different components to a factory. So, um, so hopefully this uh, kind of addresses your question. Hopefully we didn't rant too much. We, we didn't rant almost at all. No. Um, not that it's a bad thing. But uh, there you go. So now you know more about AEV trucks and you have some perspective here. Guys, have a wonderful week. Please let us know in the comments below what you think. Remember to see us. What's our Patreon uh, address? Patreon.com slash TFL car. It's our only Patreon page for all everything we do at alltfl.com. One website, alltfl. It does it all because we have eight channels, four websites, and three podcasts. Yeah, we do a lot. See you next time.